morning, sons of the Most High, and welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. A warm welcome to all the sons of Gate Ministries, Durban Central. A special welcome to all our viewers joining us for this morning's broadcast. We would like to wish all those who celebrated their birthdays in the week a very happy birthday. Granny Rita, Ashley Tyson, Taylor, Anne, and Elaine. May God continue to keep and bless you. The announcements for the week are as follows. This Wednesday is our house church meetings via Zoom. These meetings take place every alternate Wednesday, and the focus for this week will be the third teaching on forgiveness, which was delivered to us by Pastor Randolph this past Wednesday, as well as the fourth teaching on forgiveness, which we will listen to shortly. In view of this meeting, our next Bible study will take place the following Wednesday, the 8th of July. Thursdays with Tamil will take place on Thursday at 5 p.m. You can track this teaching via Facebook or YouTube. We will now enjoy a time of worship with the Gate DC music team, followed by a recently written song by Carla Joshua titled, Flowing From My Heart. Thereafter, we will have the scripture reading and invocation by Renee Barnwell, followed by a duet by Carla Joshua and Bruce Eves titled, Choose to Forgive. We will then listen to The Word of the Lord by Pastor Randolph Barnwell. God bless you.
Good morning, family and friends. It's such a delight to join you in your home once again to do the scripture reading and short exhortation. I trust that you had a wonderful week and that during these turbulent times, you continue to rely on the Word of God to be your strong anchor and your sustenance. Well, our reading today is taken from Genesis chapter 16, verse 5 to 15. But before I start reading, I would just like to give you a backdrop. When Abraham was 75 years old, God told him that he would be the father of a great nation. Sarah was barren at this time. And after 10 years, Sarah still did not conceive. So through impatience and a lack of faith, Sarah suggested to Abraham, her husband, that he sleep with her servant Hagar, because at that time it was custom that a barren wife could give her female servant to her husband in order to produce an heir. Abram agreed and Hagar conceived. Once Hagar was pregnant, she started to develop an attitude towards Sarah and she despised her. Sarah in return started to treat her very harshly. So we take up our reading from there. Verse 5 says, then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from? And where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are a child, and you shall be a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. And our key verse is verse 13. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also seen him who sees me? Therefore the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. So Beer Lahai Roy was a spring in the wilderness where God spoke to Hagar and promised to preserve and to provide for her. The meaning of Beer Lahai Rohi means the well of the life of vision. It also means the well of the living who sees me. So Bia Lahai Rohi is all about sight, our sight of God and God's sight of us. It was here where Hagar literally saw the Lord. And after he declared his provision and promises, Hagar declared, You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also here seen him who sees me? I like the way it reads in the ESV version of the Bible. It says, You are a God of seeing, for she said, Truly, yeah, I have seen him who looks after me. The challenge to you and I is this. Do you see the God who sees you? Do you see that he sees you? Hagar probably felt some anger, bitterness and jealousy towards Sarah, probably feeling that she had been used. But even in that state, she was not abandoned by God. She recognized God's gracious dealings with her in his appearance in the hour of her distress. She must have felt unworthy. God appeared to her. God approved of her. God considered her plight and God's gaze was upon her. He gently brought rectitude into her life by telling her to go back after his gracious promises to her. In the wilderness, Hagar saw the one who constantly had his eye upon her and assured her of his provision and preservation. She was overwhelmed that this mighty and loving God took note of her. Friends and family, God's eye is always watching over us. In our wilderness or desert experience, or in our sickness, in the pandemic, in your pain, hurt and loneliness, God's eye is forever watching over you. 
This is confirmed in Psalm 34 verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. Isaac too knew this experience because it was at this very place, Bia Lahai Ruhi, where he was waiting on God and praying and trusting God to provide a wife for him. And when he had finished praying, the Bible says he lifted up his eyes and had sight of a camel approaching with Rebekah on it. A wife was provided by the Lord for him at Bia Lahai Ruhi, the place of sight, provision and preservation. So where there is mutual sight, we will see expressions of preservation and provision and declarations of prophetic promises by the Lord. The Lord saw and regarded Isaac's prayer and Isaac saw the hand of the Lord in the provision of his wife, Rebekah. In Chronic, 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9a, it reads, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal towards him. Beloved, let's get our hearts right and recruit the attention of the Lord who will show himself strong on our behalf. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 8 it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Once again, it's all about our heart posture. When we maintain our purity, the state of our hearts will determine the clarity in our eyes. Our eyes of understanding will be open and we will see and acknowledge that it is God who works in us and for us. And thereby we too can declare as Hagar declared, I see the God who sees me. Amen. Shall we pray? Dear loving and gracious Father, we thank you that you the God who sees us. Father, we pray that as our hearts are loyal to you, you may show yourself strong on our behalf. Father, may we forever be pure in heart because we know it's the pure in heart that will see you. Open our eyes of understanding, God, that we may see and acknowledge your work in our lives. We love you, Father. We thank you for your word that sustains us. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you are the God who sees us. We bless you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, Amen. God bless you. What we say to each other the heart of our home. The enemy searches for that which in time will destroy the blessed union our Lord God has joined. So we must choose
decide to forgive, choose to forgive, life and blessing will reign when we choose. Well, a very good morning to one and all and welcome once again to our Sunday morning online broadcast channel. My name is Randolph Barnwell. I'm the Senior Elder of Gate Ministries Durban Central and it's a wonderful privilege to have all of you join in with us this morning. This morning represents our fifth session in our probing into the subject of forgiveness. And we've dealt variously with the subject up to this point, extracting principles from Scripture that should regulate, determine, direct, or govern our mastery of forgiveness. Recall I said to you that to master love, we need to master relationships. Conversely, to master relationships, we need to master love. Love must be the dominant, the predominant disposition that characterizes all sons of God. And to master relationships by mastering love, we need then to master forgiveness. Because at some point in time, inevitably in life, both in the church and in the world, so to speak, you are going to encounter relational tensions, relational hurts between yourself and another person or between yourself and other persons between yourself and even other whole groups of people and that you need to of necessity know how to handle offenses when they come pains hurts inflicted or leveled against you need to be approached in a christ-like fashion and so what we have been doing is looking into the scripture 
to master what Jesus called to forgive 70 times 7. Now, I'm not going to go into a rehearsal of those principles. I will greatly encourage you to please consult the prior four episodes so that you pitch into some of the principles that are seriously relevant and important for you and I in our quest for spiritual maturity through the mastery of forgiveness. The basis of our discussions is a parable that Jesus told, recorded for us in Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to reread the account and then move off for today's teaching from there and isolate just a few more principles of forgiveness that should characterize all of our lives. So would you read with me Matthew chapter 18 from verse 21. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, the one owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay him, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii and seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back all that was owed. So when the fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord what had happened. Then summoning him, the Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed to him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. Now, in prior broadcast, I explained what Jesus meant when he said that we must forgive 70 times 7. Now, you need to consult my prior teachings to really get the meat of the meaning of this phrase. But for the sake of today's broadcast, I want to pitch into the results or one or two of the results of unforgiveness as stated by Jesus. In this particular parable, a particular slave that was forgiven a huge debt having received mercy from the king, a debt which he would be unable to pay in his lifetime, that slave could not forgive a fellow slave that owed him, by comparison, a far lesser debt and could not administrate mercy upon his fellow slave. When the king heard about this, the king called the first slave, and said, I had mercy on you, forgave you your debt, cancelled your debt, and laid no obligation on you to repay it. Should you not then also have had mercy upon your fellow slave who owed you 
a lesser debt. The consequence of the unforgiving servant's actions was imprisonment. The king commanded him and all associated with him to be thrown into prison and there to be tortured. Now I will discuss the whole issue of the torture of unforgiveness in a later broadcast. But Jesus then, as he concludes the parable, says the following, My heavenly Father will do exactly the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. I spoke at length about the fact that forgiveness towards brothers must be administered from the heart, that it must be heartfelt, that forgiveness must be a heart issue. Otherwise, it is a non-issue. There must be a, an administration of forgiveness in you and in me from our hearts towards brothers. Now, if this is not the case, if, for example, I do not forgive you, I will then be equated in this parable to the unforgiving servant and thereby suffer the same consequences of unforgiveness that he suffered. Jesus said, our Heavenly Father will do exactly the same to any unforgiving person as the King did to this unforgiving servant in this specific parable. Now, I want to, be, to bring to bear a, and, and highlight a focus upon a very serious consequence of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is not innocent. It's not something light that you can simply brush under the carpet. If anything, you have to master in your quest for spiritual maturity or in your quest to represent God, your Father, and so be called a son of peace or a son of the Most High God, you're going to have to master the issue of forgiveness. The reason being, if you don't, it has the potential to have eternal ramifications upon your eternal destiny. You could be lost forever, even from the kingdom, even from an eternal habitation spent with God your Father in the realm of eternity. You could lose your eternal state of oneness and connection with God your Father if indeed you do not master the issue of forgiveness. Now in reference to this, I want to draw, I want to draw your attention to a few very important verses that sometimes you and I, in our reading of the New Testament, we tend to gloss over and tend to overlook. The first is Matthew 18 and verse 35. At the end of this parable, note what Jesus said. My heavenly Father will do the same to you. In other words, He is not going to uh, respond to you in any dissimilar fashion to which the king responded to the unforgiving servant. He will do exactly the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. So we've read the details of this parable. You can expect no dissimilar response to you as this unforgiving servant received from the king. You will get exactly the same consequence if you choose not to forgive your brother from the heart. You will be construed, classified as wicked. You will be subject to imprisonment and torture. And all these terms, wicked, imprisoned, torture, denote a separation eternally from God your Father. The whole disposition of unforgiveness has eternal consequences and one could lose the entirety of your salvation experience and status as God's son by your posture of unforgiveness. For this reason, I treat this particular series so very, very important and I prioritize it because if we do not master this, 
our eternal state could be in serious jeopardy. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 37, it says, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Notice what Jesus says here in Luke's account. You forgive, and then you will be forgiven. The opposite is true. If you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven by God Himself. Even though you have a current relationship with God, the currency, the legitimacy, the validity of your present status as God's Son in relationship with Him could be jeopardized by your insistence on maintaining an unforgiving stance towards someone that has hurt you. It is that serious. In Mark 11 and verse 25 and 26, it says the following. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. I will at a later broadcast explain the impact of unforgiveness on one's prayer life. But in this particular passage here in Mark 11:25, Jesus says, when you are standing praying and you remember, the, for example, that there's an unresolved relational tension between you and a brother, and you do not forgive, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. So unforgiveness definitely impacts prayer power. Your prayers will be unheard if you, if you pray with an unforgiving heart. There's been many calls to prayer during the current pandemic, and I for one am a, am a strong believer in prayer. In fact, later tonight, I am part of a prayer meeting that will be broadcast live on Facebook. So I'm a firm believer in prayer. But prayer, effective prayer, is only premised based upon a righteous lifestyle. It's the prayer, effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man that avails much. And if we are going to be righteous in the earth, one aspect of our righteousness is righteousness in relationships one with the other. In this particular passage, in Mark 11, 25, Jesus said, when you are stand praying, forgive. And then he said this, if you have anything against anyone. What I want to encourage you, anything against anyone is exactly what it means. Any possible thing against any possible individual. You have to be offenseless. You have to be absolutely offense-free against any thoughts of unforgiveness, of negativity, of bitterness, anger, hatred, revenge, even an iota of it against any specific individual. Your posture of forgiveness has got to be total, has got to be complete. You literally are not allowed to. There's no such thing as a legal grudge that you can have against anyone. Because when you position yourself in prayer before God, God literally will not hear you. God will say, stop praying. Rather go sort the relational matter out, then come back. Even the scripture would later on say that when you come to the altar to present your offering and your gifts, and there you remember your brother has ought against you. Leave your gift at the altar. First, the word first means priority. First go make right with your brother. Then come back and administrate your offering. What I want to really encourage you with is that unforgiveness impacts seriously your devotional life toward God your Father. Not only can it seriously jeopardize your eternal destiny, but even the thing that we love the most as sons of God, which is communication with God our Father by prayer, will be seriously impeded if you and I hold 
unforgiveness within our hearts. May I encourage you next time you pray, pray with a clean heart. Pray with a clear heart. Pray with a heart offenseless against any particular individual, be it brothers in the kingdom or be it enemies at any level, at any possible person within your relational sphere at any level. You have to, while you pray, be convinced in your heart that you don't harbor not a negative thought against any one particular individual. Now that's a tough order, but it's a biblical order. I, I challenge you, your prayer life will go to the next level. Your prayer power will go to the next level when you pray like this. Now in Ephesians 4.32 it says, Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. So I must forgive not only because I have been forgiven, but I must forgive as I have been forgiven. And I explained this in my last broadcast. Our forgiveness must not only be accurate as an act. Forgiveness must be accurate in terms of the attitude in which it is given. So I must not just forgive because I've been forgiven. My very forgiveness must be in the character and the quality as the forgiveness that I have received from God himself. In other words, how I forgive my brother, how I forgive people must be an exact mirroring of how God has forgiven me himself. Now, Cain killed his brother Abel. And the spirit of Cain runs rampant in the earth today, where brother is killing brother. When Cain killed his brother Abel and God came to him to inquire, where is your brother Abel? Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are your brother's keeper. And I want to say this to all of you. You too are your brother's keeper. You too are your brother's protector. You too are your brother's nourisher. You too ought to love your brother. In the world and the church today, we have brothers killing each other, but not keeping each other. We are not called to be our brother's killers. We are called to be our brother's keepers. Now, inevitably, there might arise from time to time misunderstandings, disagreements, tensions, arguments, offenses between brothers. And Jesus recognized the fact, but he stressed the principle of forgiveness as that principle that will ensure that offenses, even in the kingdom of God, will not have the intended satanic effect. Now, I know from the scriptures that love is greater than death. The Song of Solomon, chapter eight, chapter 8 and verse 6, does indicate to us that love is as strong as death. It actually says, put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal over your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy as severe as show, its flashes are as flashes of fire. This text says love is as strong as death. Now think about it this way. Cain killed his brother Abel. And the scriptures liken murder as hatred. Hatred is equated to murder in the book of 1 John. Yet is 1 John 3 verse 14 says the following. We know that we have passed out from death unto life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now this text is proof. John says, if you hate a brother, you are a murderer. And then he says, no murderer has the principle of eternal life dwelling in him. 
Cain kills Abel and is equated to a murderer. Now, you might not physically murder someone, but if you hate someone, you are equated as to murdering the individual. Now, murder would be probably the last expression of unforgiveness, where you literally would kill off the person. In the parable of the unforgiving servant, this unforgiving servant took his fellow servant by the throat, choked him and demanded the money. Now, that's an expression of an intent to kill. We are killing each other every single day when we express unforgiveness to each other. Murder is rampant in symbolic form in the house of God, in the kingdom of God. And God has not called us to kill our brothers, but God has called us to forgive by the principle of love and mercy. Song of Solomon says that love is as strong as death. Yet we have a, a spirit of death by the principle of hatred, which is equated to murder running rampant. But that verse says the antidote is love. While that scripture says love is as strong as death, uh, the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 38 says that not even death can separate us from the love of God, which is proof that love is stronger than death. Now I want to encourage you, you might sit there listening to me and be totally angry, totally bitter, totally resentful, to the point of hatred towards some, someone that has hurt you, has pained you, has sinned against you in some respect or the other. And you're listening to all of this and you're listening to your classification by the scripture. This is not me. This is the scripture classifying you as wicked and classifying you as a murder, cl murderer, classifying you as the principle of eternal life does not abide in you. If you are such a one listening, I want to challenge you that the love of God is greater than the death in you. That murderous intent in you will be displaced and destroyed by the love of God. And even as you listen to me, as you receive that grace, may the Holy Ghost, Romans 5, 5 says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which has been given unto us. And I pray as you listen to me, by impartation, just receive an impartation of the love of God. And I say to you, you might think that you cannot love, but you can. The love of God is there resident in you. And I pray even as I speak by the power of God's spirit, may he shed abroad, may he distribute the love of God in your life. And may that spirit of death in you be thoroughly displaced and destroyed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has called you to be your brother's keeper, not your brother's killer. God has called you to love. God has called you to mercy. For in so doing, not only, you, only do you show yourself as the Son of God that He has called you to be, but also too, when you do this, what you recruit unto yourself is the continued administration of mercy and forgiveness from God Himself. So I want to encourage you, to, to master forgiveness in this respect. For those of you viewing by broadcast, won't you say to the person next to you, wherever you are sitting, you can love. Come on, tell them, you can love more. Tell them you're not your brother's killer. You are your brother's keeper. Okay, we are called to keep and watch over the welfare of each other. And you know, we must watch how we speak about each other. Never speak not even an inkling, not even an iota of, of negativity one towards the other. May the Holy Spirit convict us every time we are tempted to do. There mustn't even be an internal smirk, an internal snigger. It might not be overt and seen. We are very good at hiding things. And we snigger and smirk against maybe a negativity or flaw that perhaps is evident in the lives of those to whom we are called to love and relate to. The Bible says that love covers a multitude of sin. 
Love doesn't just cover sin. The scripture specifically says it covers a multitude of sin. You must train yourself to be able to cover a multitude of your brother's offenses, a multitude of your brother's weaknesses, a multitude of your brother's flaws. To this we are called and to this we must accede. To this we are called, to this we must ascribe to, to this we are called saints and by this we must live. This behavior must not just be words in the Bible. This behavior must be the word of God incarnated within our flesh. Now, let me challenge you further. We all live within a relational sphere. The entirety of our lives is in relationship with other peoples at various levels. And the context for relationships is the context scripturally uh, by which is meant that we would mature. God baptizes us baptizes us, sorry, within a relational context in order to form the nature of Christ within us. Love in you can never develop outside of the context of relating to people. But yet, relationships with people is also that context in which you are most prone to be hurt by people. Now, whenever this happens, your response to people will determine God's response to you. I wrote as a heading in my notes, the relational measurement that you apply to others will be divinely applied to you. Now, let me read a text in this regard. Luke 6 verse 36 says, Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. And do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Now, if you think about it, Jesus is saying, notice, if you, do, if you judge, you will be judged. He implores us, do not judge, so that you will not be judged. And then he says, pardon. The word pardon here is literally forgive. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. When I say to you, forgive others, when I say to you, don't be quick to judge others, when I say to you, pardon others, this text says we must do it, our mercy, our forgiveness displayed to others, it must be just as our Heavenly Father is merciful. Now, that's the level that's the quality, that's the character of forgiveness that God calls you to administrate. It's not that I must just forgive. I must forgive as I have been forgiven. And the forgiveness I give to others must reflect the quality of God's forgiveness towards me. Now God deems this so strongly that He would even say things like, If you do not do that, your, your reluctance or your unwillingness to engage the matter of forgiveness according to the measure, the quality and the character that mirrors or befits everything I am could seriously condition how He, God, will respond to you. So I want to say it again. The relational measurement that you apply to others how you measure yourself in how you relate to others, perhaps, let's say, that have offended you, will be exactly the same measure by which God will then start to relate to you. Now, not only uh, is this true, but also the manner and the attitude of your judgment to others will be the same manner and attitude that God will then meet out to you. In Matthew 7 and verse 2, it says the following, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. Now notice, I must not judge lest I be judged. And then he says, For in the way you judge. Okay, now we are called to judgment, but not in a sense of hatred, resent, resentment, anger, bitterness towards people. This is a vast subject altogether. But he says, even the way I appraise 
others. Notice, for in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you again. Now he's saying the word judge here is an assessment, an appraisal of people. This is the context in which it's used. And Jesus is saying your estimate of people, the way you size them up, and then come to a conclusion about who they are, their character, their motives, their intentions, etc. God says that the way you do it, it's not just that you do it. God now focuses on the attitude with which you do it will be exactly the same attitude and demeanor that God the Father will adopt towards you. So literally what you sow, you reap. Literally, God is saying to you, you can literally predetermine how I respond to you by how you respond to others. Let me just say this. The context for relationships is the determining factor in terms of how, let me just rephrase that, how you relate to others relationally will literally determine how God will respond and relate to you. Okay? You can expect no different response from God Himself to you as the response and attitude by which you judge and estimate others. In other words, the way you expect and would like God to, to relate to you is in your hand. Start to practice mercy. Start to practice understanding. Start to practice forgiveness reflexively. Start to cover sin instead of exposing it. And see how those dispositions will be exactly the same dispositions that God Himself will then meet out to you. Your standard, the scripture says, your standard is the standard that God will apply when He engages you. Now, in Mark 4.24, it says, And He was saying to them, Take care what you listen to, for by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you, and more will be given to you besides. It's Now, this adds another spin on things. It's not just that what you give to others will be measured to you again, but here yeah, Mark says, when God measures it to you again, He will give it back to you amplified. So if you sow unforgiveness, God will measure unforgiveness to you in an amplified sense. It is true, even in natural agriculture, the harvest is always greater than the seed. What you reap as a harvest is always infinitely larger than the original one seed that you've sown. God is saying here, yeah, so correctly in terms of how you relate to people, because not only will the same standard be measured back to you again, but I will amplify it either negatively or positively based upon how you have engaged people. This is a very serious point. I can literally predetermine how God is going to relate to me by how I treat other people. So I want to encourage you, be nice to people. Treat them well. Live peaceably with all men. Because God will see that disposition in you. God will see how even when you are hurt, you are reflexively forgiven. And even when you could have reacted negatively, you chose the path of mercy, of love, and of forgiveness. When God sees that in you, there's something in God. He says, the standard that you apply to others, my son, I will apply to you and more besides. Okay, you'll always reap more than what you have sown. Now, there's a particular matter in reference to forgiveness that I, I want to just bring your attention to. And it's a simple principle. The principle is this. Forgiveness is given. Forgiveness is given. The text in Acts 5.31 says the following, He is the one whom God exalted to His right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. 
Now, notice what it says. It says that God grants repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. Now, it's an amazing thought that forgiveness is granted or forgiveness is given. When God forgives you, He's not just saying, I absolve you of your sin. I cleanse you from your sin. And I relieve you from the negative consequences of your sin. You will not get what you deserve. My mercy will cover you. He's not just saying that. Yes, that is true. So when he says, I forgive you, he's actually giving you something. When you forgive and when you administrate or offer forgiveness to, let's say, a person that has hurt you, publicly, you are giving them the gift of forgiveness. So there's a highly impartational nature attendant with the act of forgiveness. You do not forgive just to inform the one that hurt you that you no longer hold them account to what they've done to you and that you have totally forgiven them. It's not just for information for the person. It's for impartation. Every time you say, I forgive, what you're literally doing is you're imparting some measure of the nature of Christ to that person. Now, this particular point I will elaborate quite extensively in a future broadcast where I teach that you're going to need grace for the impartation of forgiveness. Now, freely you have received, so freely you must give. The word give is even in the word forgiveness. When I forgive, I give grace. I give mercy. I impart something. Think of it like this. Every time you say to someone, I forgive you, you're not just informing them, you're imparting something to them. What are you imparting? You are mirroring, you are representing the nature of Christ. And God sees in your forgiveness a pipeline, a conduit through which His grace, which is His nature, can flow effortlessly to the person. That is why when true forgiveness is received, the person receiving it feels like a weight off their shoulders. Because you, by your declaration of I forgive you, have literally imparted grace and mercy and love to that individual. Now that's a very powerful thing. That is why the stingy person, the bitter person who tends to stinginess, has a withholding spirit and does not want to release something from them, doesn't want to give off forgiveness from, from their being. Now, a lot of the times where relationships become estranged and tense, let's say for abuses, hurts, pains, sins, offenses, or whichever that have been between the two individuals involved. If you, like I said in prior broadcasts, claim to be the more mature one, you have to offer forgiveness out of deference to your desire to please God and to represent Him. You have to, as an agent of God, as a regent of God, as the viceroy and the representation of God, you're going to have to administrate this. Now, a lot of the times, um, the person who hurt us might be at a lesser place of maturity or even, by all accounts, at a greater level of maturity than you. That's still lays an obligation on you to forgive. Your obligation to forgive is not dependent on the state of maturity of the other. Your obligation and your willingness to forgive is based upon your desire to fulfill a biblical command and to be the Son of God, the Most High in your world. Sometimes the person that has hurt you does not know how to love. And I just felt in preparation for this particular broadcast to mention this. Some of you have been hurt by people who have been hurt. The old adage is true here that hurting people hurt people. There are some 
that have leveled offenses against you, possibly even abused you physically, sexually, emotionally, were jealous of you, maybe betrayed you in a certain respect, simply because they in their time have been the recipients of those very same things. And they, without the help of God, there are some people that don't know Christ that will simply perpetuate that disposition almost generationally. But even some in Christ, who perhaps are at lesser places of maturity, can sometimes exhibit this inability to love. And they sometimes automatically default to the carnal way of reacting, simply because seeds or roots are the very same things were sown in their lives at some stage. Now, in reference to that scenario, I want to challenge you still to forgive. And why must you forgive? You see, some people simply do not know how to love. Some people know no other way than to hurt. In as much as they've been the recipients of hurt and perpetuated in their time and perhaps to their kids, and this will go on generationally. The cycle has to stop sooner or later. And what the Holy Ghost ministered to me is this, that some of you listening to me have the power to stop that cycle. If you were hurt by someone like that, when you forgive, what you do is you give forgiveness and you impart something to them. You put on display the love of God. Now I want to read two verses in this respect. In 1 John 4 verse 10, it says this, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And then verse 19, it says, We love because He loved us. Now, these verses are amazing verses. It says that we love God simply because He loved us. Why do I love God? I could never love God out of an understanding, a view, and a demonstration of how He has loved. So my love for Him is reciprocal to His love for me. I am able to love because He has loved. And it says, it's not that we love, but that God first love. It always takes someone to love first. I did not love first, you did not love God first, He loved first. And the firstness of His love is something that we reciprocate and respond to by the capacity to love Him in return. In other words, His love for me is to show me what love looks like so I can love in return. Now listen to me, there are some people that simply do not know how to love. And it's, it's your and my responsibility to when they hurt us, to forgive them in a manner that is befitting the love of God. And when they see you giving them forgiveness, they will see the love of God on display. And when you do that, when you do forgive to demonstrate the love of God, what the person receives is a baptism of love such that it will empower them to reciprocate and love in return. You know, the only reason why we love God is because He loved us first. And you sometimes have to forgive as the firstness of love demonstrated so that the person receiving your administration of this gift is able to receive an impartation of love such that they're able to love in return. I just hear the Lord saying, I've called some of you to teach others how to love. When you administrate forgiveness, think about it like this. You're giving the world an education in the love of God. You're giving the world a revelation of what true love looks like. It is true that hurting people hurt people. But it is also true that healed people heal people. If you claim to be the recipient of wholeness or greater maturity and you are heal or hold and there's someone that is hurting because you are healed 
when you administrate love, the, the place of, your, to, of the totality of the fact that you've been healed serves as a profound basis upon which you can draw someone else out of their hurt into healing itself. Now, you might argue with me and say, but the person hasn't changed. Let me just say this to you. Your administration of forgiveness is not contingent upon the person's request for it. Your administration of forgiveness is not even dependent upon whether the person has admitted to their sin or not. Your administration of forgiveness is not even dependent upon whether they've asked for your forgiveness or not. Let me say it like this. The person might not even request forgiveness. But sometimes you need to let them know of your offer of forgiveness. Think about it like this. Why could we run to God in our unsaved sinful state and say, God, forgive me a sinner. Make me your son. We only did that because he informed us of his offer of forgiveness. And we came running to him knowing full well when we get there and meet him that forgiveness, love and mercy will be the order of the day. I believe sometimes some people will not admit to their pain that they've inflicted upon you, not admit that they've wronged you simply because they are unaware of your posture of forgiveness. Now in this regard, let me read a passage of scripture. Romans 5 verse 6 to 10 says the following, For while we were yet still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone will even dare to die. But God, I like this, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Just focus on verse 8. When did Christ die for us? While we were alienated from Him. While we were sinners. While we were separated, love manifested itself. He did not wait for us to draw near to Him. He did not wait for us to acknowledge our sin. But rather He took the first step. The firstness of His love showcased itself by him dying for us when did he die for us while we were yet sinners verse 9 much more then having been justified by his blood we shall be saved from the wrath of god through him for if while we were enemies we were reconciled notice while estranged while enemies we were reconciled to god through the death of his son much more Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Your offer and your administration, your informing the person that has hurt you of your forgiveness, I believe will evoke in them a response to the demonstration of your love. Just like when Christ demonstrated his love for us while being alienated from him. It was that demonstration when we saw it that provoked or evoked within us a desire to come to him and to surrender our lives to him. Now, in this regard, there's a lovely verse in Romans 2 verse 4, which says the following. Do or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness, the tolerance and the patience, knowing that the kindness of God leads to repentance. You and I were only able to repent simply because God was kind. His kindness, notice, led you to repent. Repentance involves a confession of sin and an acknowledgement of sin. But it says something led you there. What led you there? The kindness of God led you to repent. And repentance includes a, an, a, an offer of the forgiveness of sins. So, the forgiveness of sins, the entirety of this concept, principle, or process has got to be led by something called kindness. The kindness of God led me to that place 
of repentance. In this regard, every human being is a leader. God has called every human being to forgive the other. By the principle of kindness in you, you can lead the person that has hurt you to a place of repentance when they see kindness showcasing itself within the posture of forgiveness. Now, while I said that even if the person has not asked for it, you must offer it, your offer of forgiveness is not dependent upon the state of the person. But forgiveness can only be truly enacted. The entirety that all that attends it processed when the person to whom it's offered receives it. Even their unwillingness to receive it must still not, however, affect you in terms of your not offering it. But for your sake, always offer it. For their sake, they're going to have to receive it for its power to be released within, within their life. Now, I want to encourage you here that even on the part of Jesus and Stephen in the scripture, in the height of their suffering, in the height of the pain leveled against them by men, they forgave. And I want to read the two scriptures. These are powerful scriptures containing powerful principles of forgiveness for you and I. In Luke 23 verse 33 it says, When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him, and the criminals, one on his right and the other on, his, on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In Acts 7, verse 59 and 60 records the death of Stephen. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. Having said this, he fell asleep. These two contain very powerful principles on forgiveness. One is this. Ignorance in your offender must be a primary motivating factor for you to forgive. I want to say it again. The ignorance in your offender must in you be a powerful motivating factor for you to offer them forgiveness. Why did Jesus forgive? And he did so in the height of being the recipient of the hatred of men. He said this, I forgive you because really you don't know what you're doing. You are ignorant as to your present actions. So I will forgive you because you are not in your right mind. Now, ignorance of the offenders was Jesus's motivation to forgive them. Again, I want to stress the words forgive. Father, forgive them. Why? Because they really do not know what they are doing. In Stephen's case, he said, Lord, receive my spirit, but do not hold this sin, their sins against their charge. Jesus forgave based upon the ignorance of the offenders. I want to say this to you. Anyone who has hurt you was not in their right frame of mind spiritually. Anyone who has hurt you did not know what they were doing. Now you might argue with me and say, Randolph, no, I have proof. They know what they did. They knew what they were doing. They knew well the repercussions this thing will have upon my life. But let me just say to you, when I say ignorance, scripturally, ignorance alludes to a darkened area of the mind upon which the light of God has not yet shone. Many men, including men in the kingdom of God, uh, sons of God, both women and men, sometimes function uh, in life behaviorally based upon a darkened area within their souls. Now, your spirit could be thoroughly regenerated, but the area of your soul requires progressive renewal day by day, year by year, until you come to the place of complete perfection. 
Now, sometimes we act in ignorance or we act in immaturity. And we act in the ignorance of our minds. I want to encourage you. If any person has leveled hurt against you, what really helps me is this. I say at the back of my mind, one of the motivations that helps me to forgive is this. They don't really know what they're doing. I can forgive easily my offenders because if they were truly spiritually mature, they would not do what they did. If they were truly enlightened, they will not do what they did. So I don't hold them accountable because they function based upon a mindset that did not have the completeness of the illumination of the light of God in that area of their understanding. And Jesus very readily said this, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Now might I close by saying this, I taught you last time that forgiveness is a decision, not necessarily an emotion. When you forgive, you decide to forgive from the mind of your spirit, not based upon the emotional content of your soul. You are spirit, soul and body. From the mind of your spirit, instruct the emotion of your soul, however pained, however distraught, to administrate the act of forgiveness. Forgiveness and its administration primarily is not a soulish domain. It must function from a place of enlightenment in the mind of your spirit. It's not a soulish decision per se. It is largely a spiritual decision. At one time, David said this to his soul. I think it's in Psalm 42 when he says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you so disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for he is the help of your countenance. Here is a man from the vantage point of his spirit addressing his soul. Why are you distraught? Now, similarly, I want to challenge you from the vantage point of spiritual authority in the mind of your spirit, you command maybe the pain uh, that you are still feeling from the hurt that the person level against you and you speak to your soul why are you still in pain but when you make a decision from the platform of your spirit it will really help your soul to come to a place of healing and then what will happen is in that instant in which the mind of your spirit authoritatively commands your soul the mind of your soul agrees and you will forgive the person as an act of your will in compliance with God's, God's commandments. And what you will start to experience in the emotion of your soul is an instant healing of your bitterness and perhaps an instant or progressive healing of the associated pain, trauma that you felt because of what was done against you. But might I encourage you, it all starts with a decision. And by the power of the love of God, the grace of God, you today can make that decision, that choice to forgive someone that has hurt you within a negative fashion. I want you to bow your hearts in prayer with me as we pray. Just bring your life before the Lord. I just see by the Spirit in the lives of those who are viewing today that God wants to use you as the conduit of His love to men. But you have to not let the negative emotion of your soul displace the decision of the mind of your spirit to administrate this forgiveness. You have to give forgiveness to another. When you do, you educate them in the love of God. You will love first so that others can love reciprocally. And I want to encourage you by this you demonstrate that indeed you are the Son of God. When you do so, not only will you be healed, and not only will your healing be fast-tracked, but also too, you will be a balm and a source of healing in the future to a whole range of other people who are struggling in the very, very same area. So forgive, not just because you have been forgiven, 
Forgive also as you have been forgiven. And the measure you sow, the standard you meet out, will be exactly the same standard and measure by which God will respond to you. So forgive so that you can be forgiven in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your grace. Thank you, God, that even in this broadcast, your spirit has been abundant. Your grace has been flowing. I ask even now for a baptism of the love of God in the hearts of all who are viewing. Your word says that you, Holy Spirit, are able to shed abroad the love of God in Christ in our hearts. And so do that right now in the name of Jesus. Right now, I pray strength to the minds of every spirit listening to this broadcast. I pray your people will come to a place of decision. May we forgive reflexively. May we forgive spontaneously. May we become showpieces of the love of God in Christ Jesus to a lost and a dying world. May your love flow through us this week and for the rest of our lives, God, as we come to a place of total and complete and full forgiveness. If we stand praying, your word says, and if we have anything against anyone, we must forgive. We do that right now. As an act of our, of our will, we forgive anyone that has hurt us. We set them free. We ask that you would create occasions for us, Father, and the ideal circumstances for us to let our offenders know, not just to inform them, but to impart to them this gift of forgiveness. I thank you that by your grace, we are able to do this. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. As we come to the table of the Lord, I want to encourage you to get your emblems ready. As we partake of His body and His blood, I want to celebrate the gift of forgiveness. Jesus is the epitome of love, the absolute apex of forgiveness and of mercy. In the height of His suffering, He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Sam Solon, an apostle that we usually respect, said the following, Spiritual maturity is to love the other whilst the other hates you. It is to offer forgiveness while they hate you. He died for us while we were yet sinners. So as you eat of his body, drink of his blood, remember his death in absolute gratitude this morning, in sheer gratefulness, for the gift of salvation as you partake receive grace and faith for the administration of forgiveness on a brand new level in your life amen well great grace and peace to you thank you for joining us this morning I want to encourage you to join us again next week sunday morning where we're having a very special guest, a friend, a pastor in our city, Durban, in the person of France Duplessis. And he's going to share his thoughts with us on how mercy should govern forgiveness. So I want to welcome you to that occasion and I look forward to seeing you again on this channel. Great grace and abundant peace be your portion in Jesus' name.